What's up, y'all? This is Chitty Bang, and I'm on the Renegade Millionaire Show, the podcast that profiles entrepreneurs, founders, and CEOs. Join us as we go one-on-one inside the hearts and minds of some of our generation's best and brightest. And now, introducing your host, my friend, Sun Group Wealth Partners Managing Director, CNBC and Forbes.com contributor, Winnie Sun. Welcome to Renegade Millionaire. This show is coming live to you from the ultra-modern TuneIn.com studio in sunny Venice Beach, California. This is your host, Winnie Sun, founder and managing partner of Sun Group Wealth Partners, a financial planning firm here based in Southern California. I'm excited to be back with you again today. With almost 15 years of experience in the wealth management industry, I've always wanted to work on a project such as this. The wealth management financial planning industry is really getting a complete overhaul, and this show is really part of that evolution. Our kids are going to be getting financial advice from Siri or whatever Siri evolves into. But this is radio, and you can't see me. But if you did, you see that I don't fit your typical financial advisor profile. I look different, talk different, and I spend time with some pretty interesting people. Once I dropped my oldest child off to kindergarten, I put on my financial advisor glasses figuratively. And in my roles as a, I guess, a successful financial advisor, a market commentator on CNBC's Closing Bell broadcast, and now a contributor to Forbes, I meet and get to surround myself with some pretty wealthy and extremely successful leaders in their fields. They can be extremely dynamic and interesting and quite entertaining as people. I would, also, I would often have conversations in how they built their wealth. And if you're looking at someone um, as an entrepreneur to get your juices flowing, spend an afternoon with one of the greatest. I wish there were so many times that we could be recording these stories that we would have in our office to share with my kids. And now, thanks to TuneIn, we can. Which leads me to the evolution of the renegade millionaire. The idea is these incredible people and their authentic, transparent stories are the ones that I wanted to share with an audience who is trying to build their own legacy. So again, welcome to Renegade Millionaire. And before I introduce you to today's guests, let me give you a quick market update and some news that I thought you might be interested in following. So last week on CNBC, we were talking about oil and corporate earnings and things to be um, to pay attention to as an investor. And some of the things that we really want you to focus on is to be comfortable with what's going on with the markets. Obviously, the market's done extremely well. The stock market has rallied for so many years. It's almost been five years. S&P has almost tripled during that time. So we do know that we've had a pretty nice, healthy run. And what does that mean to you as the investor? What should you be doing? Well, some things that we are doing back at, back at our house is talking about profit-taking. It's something that a lot of people talk about but don't really do. So what we encourage you to do is take a look at your own portfolio and take a look at those gains and consider taking some profit, keeping some cash on the sidelines, and evaluating weakness in the market, meaning when there are times of dips and pullbacks, see those as opportunities rather than being worried about what's happening um, in countries and conditions that you can't control. So on that note, we will go now to introducing our first guest, who I'm really excited to introduce all of you to. He's a, he's a very, very good friend of mine and also um, just a leader in the financial, real estate, mortgage industry. Ivan Choi. Welcome, Ivan. Good morning, Winnie. Thank you so much for joining us today. No problem. (laughs) 
Well, I, I I guess you know you and I have been friends for some time, and I'm I'm able to follow you on Facebook and LinkedIn, so I just feel like we're always in communication. So this is exciting. But some things that I didn't know about you, Ivan, after doing a little bit of homework, is that I found that you are actually、um, recognized by the National Mortgage Professional Association as selected as being one of the top twenty five most connected. Mortgage professionals in the United States—that's a big deal. It kind of came up as a surprise, but you know, I, I don't really keep track.、Uh, it's just—it's it, fun to be out there with people. So it's funny that they would、uh, put that—that that,、uh, they would tag me with that. So your 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 family must love that, right?、Uh, Well, they they actually want me to stay home a little more, so <laughs> I don't know that that doesn't work out. <laughs> well, it doesn't work out. I mean, also being the chairman of ARIA, which stands for the maybe you could tell us what ARIA stands for. So ARIA is the Asian Real Estate Association of America, which is a big deal, right? Because it seems like there's a lot of new money coming into not just here us here in sunny California, but all across the United States. There's been a lot of inflow of new investment money coming in from Asia. Oh yeah, especially in real estate.、Um, you know, the demographic here for the Asian、uh, population is. Pretty strong when you take a look at education level, income level, all those sorts of things. But just as you kind of mentioned, one of the big developments. I mean, it's something that's been going on in the U.S. for a while. But there is a surge of money and people that are coming out of Asia that either are looking to invest in the U.S. or looking to actually essentially start a new life in the U.S. Now, why is that? Why do they want? I think that's、uh, I've I've heard that a lot. What is it that they love, and where is it that they love? Obviously, we know a lot of immigrants come to United States for a better life,、mm -hmm. for a better education for their children, right? Right. As did our our parents did back in the day.、Um, but what is the trend that you're seeing today? Well, I mean, the main one is education. That still holds true. Um, there is an entity in mainland China called the Hu Run Report, which is a pretty big deal if if、um, you haven't heard about it. And they track、um, and provide a lot of research around what high net worth Chinese people and families are doing. And I point them out because it ties back to education. The, the top two countries for、uh, just Chinese,、uh, you just take them.、Uh, top two、uh, countries are. The uh, uh, Great Britain, as well as the United States.、Um, so whether it's colleges, and it's not even just so much colleges anymore. It starts to go back into junior high, into elementary schools, and you have families from Asia that are trying to set themselves up、um, even further back than actually actually just college. So education is number one. The second one is, and I think it might be intuitive to a lot of people, but. The、um, the financial system,、um, the legal system in the U.S. is very attractive to anyone、uh, that is looking to place capital, and、um, certainly the U.S. is is looked at as as a、um, you know I hate to use the word safe haven, but that's basically what it boils down to. So what does that mean by safe haven? So、um, you don't have let's say a government that can all of a sudden change its mind and start reaching into your bank accounts back home. For instance,、um, you know you don't you you aren't subject to the whims and and、um, you know any kind of、uh, new develop un unforeseen、uh, development that could unfairly、um, you know position you. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. So we we hear a lot about how、um, these buyers are coming from overseas and coming with bags of cash. And buying homes on a whim, right? A million dollars here. I think in New York, what is it? Five million dollars here is like buying a hamburger at In and Out. So,、um, <laughs> is that a trend that you see sustaining, or is that starting to change?、Um, so, yeah, the the bags of cash. I mean, when you listen to people's stories and the anecdotes,、um, especially from years past,、um, certainly there there were funny stories and crazy stories about bags of cash being. Thrown around, but when it comes to the Asian demographic, for those coming out of Asia,、um, for a lot of countries,、uh, especially recently, it's actually hard, getting harder to move cash outside of the home country, and it's because the home countries realize that you know it's it, it, in many ways they're better served if the capital actually stays within their boundaries. 
But having said that, people are still very resourceful, and there are ways to move cash out. Um, and there's certainly a lot of capital, you know, as mentioned from the very beginning, that is um, being moved out in different ways and and being aggregated here in a place like the U.S. And you're certainly seeing it in major cities um, for the Asian demographic. I mean, whether it's, um, you know, back east in New York, whether it's Chicago or Dallas in the middle, whether it's uh, San Francisco Bay Area or L.A., um, you see that the Asian demographic is coming in pretty strong. So what is Aria's role in this? I mean, I, I had the pleasure, thank, thank you very much for inviting me to the National Aria Conference. And I was so impressed. I mean, this, this event, for those of you who weren't able to attend, was held at Bellagio in Las Vegas, one of the most beautiful hotels, easily casino hotels in all of Vegas. And literally, there were just swarms of people. But not only that, is that the people, the different companies that sponsored the event were just first of class. Everybody wanted to be part of ARIA. And um, I thought, I found it so fascinating because it, there was no issue of whether that, whether you should be there. Every vendor, whether they came from, um, had an Asian background or not, wanted to be at this event that, that you you put together. So maybe you could tell us a little about ARIA's history and how it was formed and really um, what, what, what you would like to see ARIA do more. Of. So our ARIA is actually, you know, it's a relatively young organization. It's uh, currently in its 11th year. Um, it was actually founded, uh, a lot of the planning meetings happen in Houston, but it was really West Coast based for a while. Uh, but just to give everyone some sense, ARIA is now an organization. So just 11 years ago, started with nothing and a negative balance in its bank account to now there are um, just about 15,000 members across the country, 34 chapters across the U.S., including one in Vancouver, Canada. Um, and uh, the original mission for ARIA was on focused on sustainable homeownership. And the way um, that the two stated ways in which ARIA uh, tried to reach, uh, serve that mission was to, number one, advocate for policy positions at the national level um, to help the Asian demographic. And then the second uh, way in which we achieve the mission is by providing business opportunities for anybody that um, actually serves uh, the Asian uh, real estate population when it comes to mortgage finance or real estate. And one thing that I kind of want to underline in all this is that um, it's not really just about an organization like ARIA trying to help the Asian demographic in whatever ways, but it's really about the uh, ARIA organization being kind of uh, the place where uh, we do further that mission and we, we, do, we do help uh, those that are in need, but also we, uh, are, we uh, want to give the mainstream an opportunity to fully access the Asian demographic in a way that they might not have been able to do on their own. Right. So. Right. And I, I thought that was very positive because it wasn't just about serving a group of people that brought in a lot of cash to invest, but it's really to foster a, an environment or a culture and a group where uh, people would share ideas and work on different strategies to do more business and to better serve this community. Right. right. I mean, I think that's what I felt from Aria. That was your aura. Yes, definitely a safe environment. We get a lot of compliments on the convention. It plays into, I think, why um, you experienced uh, some of the feedback that or you received some of the feedback that you got. I mean, it really is a safe environment. Uh, people want to come in. It represents a huge business opportunity that anyone should want to get involved in. I mean, the, the just to size up the business opportunity, the Asian demographic, the population within the U.S. is just a little less than 6% of the population, yet the purchasing power of the Asian demographic is somewhere in the uh, 23 to 24% range, and a lot of the wealth creation actually occurs through real estate over a generation or two. So that's interesting. Do you see that being because the Asian demographic just prefers investing in real estate versus other traditional investment asset classes? Well, it, it, um, in all of the commentary from ARIA and, and um, the experience that we generally get within the organization, uh, you know, fundamentally from a cultural standpoint, the Asian demographic is very family focused. And it's always about making sure that there's a, a good um, established 
uh, uh, place for the family. And of course, home plays into that. And so when you talk about cultural um, preferences, when it comes to the Asian demographic, purchasing real estate early on is typically uh, one of the big goals aside from education. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a strong motivator and it typically happens early. So Ivan, not to put you on the spot on this, but let's say we had a million dollars to buy real estate. Um, where would you, where do you think, where do you think our listeners should be looking at? <laughs> Good question. So uh, just my opinion, but I think in a, any major metropolitan area, especially uh, play, uh, communities and neighborhoods that typically have been overlooked, um, that um, you know are, are being re- redeveloped in some way. I mean, we see plenty of examples of that um, around the U.S. I mean, whether in Chicago, you know, I point back to the major cities again, whether in Chicago, whether in New York, um, whether in L.A., I mean, you, you certainly see examples of that um, in, in a lot of places. And somewhere near a good school, right? That's somewhere right. near a good school, That's absolutely. Well, well, great. Um, I guess, well, well tell us, where, when when is the next convention, the next national convention, and you did it at Bellagio, so are you going you gonna to trump that? <laughs> I, I, yes, we are, we are trying to trump it, and we are, uh, last year we were actually in um, the, the Waldorf Astoria in New York City, uh, where we had about uh, 800 uh, attendees. Uh, the year prior, we actually had it in Honolulu at the Royal Hawaiian, but yes, we are planning to, we are trying to trump it, and we are uh, going to hold our next uh, annual Global Luxury Summit at the at the Trump Hotel in Chicago, Illinois. Okay. So nope. that, that's coming up in April. Fun stuff, fun stuff. Okay, well, now I'm going to ask you, we're going to take it back a little bit. I, you know, this is something that's, to me, very fascinating. So last week, when I was on CNBC, one of the stories that was coming out was that millennials, uh, are not that interested in purchasing real estate, amongst many other things, cars and whatnot, investments in general. So, you know, you and I both have children under the age of seven. So, you know, our kids today are going to be even much younger than millennials of today. So when you look at them, first off, you know, I didn't ask you the tough question is when you thought interest rates were going to come back up. So I'll ask you that later. But I guess the question is, what do you think how home buying is going to look like for our kids? And where do you think mortgage, the mortgage industry is going to look like for our children to continue to be interested in purchasing real estate? Or are they not going to purchase real estate anymore? Is it all going to be just renters? Well, so, um, you know, I think a, a lot of the commentary that's out there, I believe, holds true. And that's common. I mean, so when you take a look at the millennial generation, um, if they're not interested in real estate, it's actually kind of hard to blame the average millennial because here they are, they took out a lot of student loans. That's certainly a problem, as I'm, I'm sure we've all heard. So they come out of the marketplace. Not only are they burdened with these loans that they have to repay, but as we all know, employment is kind of tough for them um, as they enter the job force. Um, you know, everything put together, um, you know, their savings rate is non existent. I mean, all these factors kind of play in. So of course, you know, when when you're being put in that position, I think naturally you're not going to have much of an interest. Um, you know, there there will be a point, I believe anyway, where, you know, once uh, they do get some footing, it'll be a little bit later in life perhaps, uh, but there will be a point where they do get some footing and uh, they will be looking very, um, very uh, closely at, at trying to get into a home of some sort. Study after study shows that younger American adults aged 18 to 33, or what we call millennials, are really less likely to own a home, have a full-time job, own a car, or even use a credit card than you know, us and the older American generation. So there's a lot of reasons for financial disadvantages for millennials facing compared to previous generations. So on that note, I guess I was hoping you could share a little bit about millennials, and more so millennials, but even our the younger generation, like our kids, the kindergartners. And maybe you could paint a picture for us. What's it going to look like when they purchase their home? 
Sure. So it's it's a question that's on everyone's minds. And, you know, when you look at the millennials and what you mentioned about them being um, a little bit disadvantaged, you know, so it, it, I think it is true, the commentary that says that millennials really aren't that interested in purchasing a home right now. And uh, I mean, who could blame them? Because they're saddled with a lot of uh, college debt in some cases. Um, employment is very tough for them to find. And it's, it's difficult to uh, get themselves established so that they actually are in a position to uh, make uh, one of life's biggest purchases, uh, which is the home, of course. So, uh, you know, at some point, though, I do believe millennials will get established, that um, things over the long term will uh, work out um, uh, okay for them, and they'll be back in the market. And when that time comes, by the way, I think real estate is going to end up being super strong. Um, as a side note, uh, right now, the baby boomers are, if you, if you talk to uh, demographers and you talk to economists, um, a lot of times the commentary they provide is that baby boomers are having a hard time actually downsizing and retiring because uh, there aren't enough people behind them from um, other generations coming up to actually take their place. So having said all that, um, when millennials do get their footing, real estate will um, will be very strong in my personal opinion. That's just some conjecture and we're, we're probably uh, five to ten years away from that. But to get back to your question, uh, to bring it up even uh, further down the line, what it's going to look like for our kids who are in kindergarten today. Are they going to uh, ask Siri to buy them a house? Like, how, how do I buy a house? <laughs> like, what's going to happen, Ivan? They're going to be asking Siri, the government. They're going to be – they could potentially be asking a lot of people uh, for It'll be Grandma help Siri by, by then. <laughs> yeah, Grandma Siri. <laughs> Um, you know, one, one funny thing is when you talk to housing policy advocates today and people that work within the current uh, administration and with the GSEs and the government entities that are involved in housing and finance, um, you'll often hear anecdotes about how even for them in their na- in neighborhoods, um, they've actually had to help their kids who, uh, for a lot of them, their kids have just graduated college recently. And they'll tell you that they actually have been helping their children with their uh, down payments. And, um, you know, if if the U.S. for some reason loses loses a little bit of its economic footing in future decades, you know, that situation could be exacerbated. And we may be needing to help our children even more if we want them to truly realize this, you know, this American dream of, of home ownership. And being able to establish their own family and their their own generation going forward. So that means there's another financial bucket we need to worry about. So it's retirement planning, education yes. planning for our kids, and now it's now Junior's house. Yes, I mean I you know you had mentioned when we've hung out before, Winnie, you've talked about um, helping companies with um, education planning for their kids. Uh, you, you got it. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, you're absolutely right. It's not just the education piece, but it's the housing piece as well. Because even today, you know, we talked earlier about um, foreign nationals coming in and getting their families established. I mean, that kind of competition is going to be uh, even bigger, in my opinion, when it comes to our kindergartners' uh, time as they move into um, housing as well. Right, right, right. Well, exciting but a little scary a all little at freaky. once. <laughs> I know, especially with me because I have three, oh, three house accounts in addition to three college educations. Well, thank you, Ivan. That's helpful. So your daughter, renter or buyer? Uh, my daughter is because of me, unfortunately. <laughs> Mr. She, Mr. She's, real Estate. She's going to be a buyer, definitely. <laughs> For sure, right? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do all I can to help her with that. Great, great. Absolutely. Well, we've talked a little about your business. I mean, um, you have basically in so many ways impacted thousands of people as it pertains to real estate and mortgage business in the United States. And you continue to lead the charge, not only with ARIA, but I know that you're involved with several other major organizations and you've been awarded several uh, real estate designations as well. Um, I guess what I want to know is, so what's your passion? What's your purpose? Like, what other things do you want to say, this is part of my Ivan Choi legacy? (laughs) Well, it, it sounds kind of corny, I mean, but the reason why I'm involved in these different organizations is because it just comes back to um, the basic belief that I do strongly believe in helping everyone around me. 
And, you know, I firmly believe in, in doing that, you know, you find uh, more than enough opportunity for yourself. And the real estate can be, whether you look at real estate or the mortgage industries, um, they are uh, in a lot of ways so fragmented and there's a really big opportunity um, in there to uh, bring uh, certain groups of people together and actually find ways to achieve things that are meaningful, not just um, you know for our businesses, but for our families as well. That's so great. I mean, that's that's really why I get into it. It's easy to try to stand back and be greedy and just really focus on the money making aspect, but um, you know our time is is pretty short, and why not along the way um, try to do what you can for others um, while you can. Yeah. So. So for you, it is passion. I mean, because it's hard for you. I mean, how often do you travel per month? Yeah, it's it's a uh, travel. Sc- I mean, I'm used to uh, business travel, but it's been about three weeks out of every month, um, every year for the last twelve years, just spent on the road. On the yeah. road, trying to make a difference. Right? Trying trying to help out in some way. That the travel. People always ask, you know, what's the travel like? Well. The travel isn't always that fun. I mean, I wish I, I was on, uh, you know, private jets and that sort of thing, but I'm on commercial. But, you know, what makes you forget everything is when you arrive at your destination, you're with a great group of people. I mean, you really um, forget what it took to get you there, and you you just kind of get focused on the present and what you can possibly do together. So what is your goal when you get to the destination, you meet the group of people, what is it that you're trying to help them with? Well, so the goal for me is always when you arrive, it's about getting, um, you know, a a group of people together um, and kind of taking account and understanding exactly what is happening in in that local area. Because, you know, the general trends oftentimes are the same, but there are always little things that pop up that you don't want to miss. Um, So you want to take that into account. And then, of course, just like for any business or any salesperson out or, you know, just anyone who's trying to do anything, um, once you have that understanding, it's a matter of figuring out, you know, what can you do together um, to and and what do you want to achieve together at that point, given the situation. Right. So you basically you like, for example, let's just say hypothetically you show up in Lubbock, Texas, Mm -hmm. Texas, and they said, you know, these are our challenges. Nobody understands, you know, and um, so you try to figure out what their needs are and you try to connect them with the appropriate parties. Right, right. right. So if you can if you can connect with the appropriate parties in Lubbock, um, sometimes you need, you know, a, a broader level of connection. Maybe there's um, something that warrants a lot more attention and you, you got to, you know, get, uh, for instance, the, the White House staff maybe, uh, 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 updated and involved on what's going on in Lubbock. I mean, you, you really, you really got to evaluate what's what's going on. Wonderful. So thank you so much, Ivan. I really appreciate your time today. Um, uh, maybe if somebody wants to reach out and get to know you better, I know that you have a profile on LinkedIn. If there's any other way that you can think of that they could communicate with you, you know, feel free to share with us today. Is there? Sure. Uh, so you can, uh, you know, I know it may seem kind of crazy, but uh, reaching me via email is just fine. And you can reach me at I C H O I at aria spelled A R E A A dot org. A R E A A dot org. Perfect. Well, I would like to thank my guest, Ivan Choi, for an interesting and insightful interview. Ivan, thank you for sharing your views on all things real estate with us. It's certainly a popular conversation topic these days. This is Winnie Sun broadcasting from the TuneIn.com studio in sunny Venice Beach. You can learn more about me by searching Winnie Sun on LinkedIn, our website at www.sungroupwp.com, and follow me on Twitter at hashtag SungroupWP. Thank you so much, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you, Winnie.